Thank you, Wen, for that kind introduction. And I also want to echo congratulations to those who worked so hard to put on the local transgender health summit. It was uh, a fantastic uh, uh, experience for me. I was here throughout the day. And what I loved was seeing how the local community came together to put on this transgender uh, health summit and how we brought it home to LA. Enough of this, the work that's being done in San Francisco and in DC, let's bring it home to LA. We have trans here and our trans uh, population here have their own voice and let's host it here. Thank you, I say let's do it again. Um, In, in, in fact, the National Transgender Health Summit is in, San, is in San Francisco or Oakland every other year on the odd years, 2011, 2013, 2015. I suggest we have a local one on the even years so that people have uh, summits to go to every year and can get uh, updates on an annual basis on what's going on with trans health. But again, congratulations, you guys did a superb job. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, both uh, globally, looking nationally at trans health and trans disparity, but also talk about what we have here in Los Angeles. Let me turn this on. Nobody I know works independently, and I certainly don't. And so I want to acknowledge um, some of the people that have influenced my work, that I have worked with over the years, that people who have influenced my thinking, that have influenced the research that I do in the program development. Uh, this was the hardest slide for me to develop uh, because I, kn I, I, I know I'm leaving a lot of people out. In fact, I'm looking around the room now and seeing, oh, I should have added that name, I should have added that name. But I, I narrowed it to people who specifically uh, I, I, I've worked with and have had these conversations with that have moved the, the work forward. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna have a working definition of transgender. And again, for the sake of this presentation, we use transgender as an umbrella term for individuals whose gender identity differs from the biological sex they were assigned at birth. And for the purpose of this presentation, transgender refers to all such individuals regardless of their stage of gender transition. And it's important to remember although I'm preaching to the choir, I assume, that one's gender identity is different from their sexual identity. Those are two separate domains. I feel terrible I have my back to you guys. It's just, this feels very awkward to me, so I want to apologize, but I've got to read my slides. So I'm sorry. Um, so it's estimated that about 14 uh, 1,400 uh, trans individuals live in Los Angeles County with a range between 7,200 and 21,5-ish, uh, depending on the definition. A narrow definition would be those that are engaged in uh, some form of uh, hormone therapy or transitional um, surgeries, and a broad definition would include people who identify as cross-dressers. To go with the working definition that we use uh, would, would look at the, range, the estimate of 14,000. And there's an estimated range of uh, one to one ratio of trans women and trans men. So approximately 7,200 trans women and 7,200 trans men in LA County. And the size of the trans population has been consistently estimated at between 0.1 and 0.5% of the overall population. And I really thank uh, DHSP for putting this report together a few years ago. It's helped us in many, many um, uh, presentations and grant applications to have these basic stats on trans uh, individuals in LA County. In the United States, uh, the odds of being H, now we're gonna to move to HIV prevalence. The odds of being HIV um, positive in the United States are 34.2% higher for trans women compared to any other, 
a population. That's astonishing. Uh, the estimated HIV prevalent rate among trans women in the United States is 27.7%, which is higher than MSM, estimated at 19%. That's over a quarter of all trans women nationally. And there are no uh, such data on trans men. You'll find that to be a continuing theme through this presentation. Let's bring it home to LA County. In Los Angeles County, uh, the estimated prevalence rate, uh, and this includes undiagnosed persons, for trans women is 21% compared to MSM at 15% and MSMW at 12%. Also, the estimated prevalence rate of trans women in LA County is 15% and trans men at 0.6%. Uh, so, the data is inconsistent. We have one report that says 21%. We have another report that says 15%. But I want to assure you that inconsistent data does not mean inaccurate data. It just depends on how you're counting the numbers and where you're counting the numbers from. So they're, they're both correct, but they're coming from different d uh, data sources. Now, when you look at racial and ethnic differences, the HIV prevalence rate is much more severe for women of color, and particularly African-American uh, trans women. Um, somebody from the public made a comment about um, how HIV is now a black woman's issue. I would like to extend that, that HIV is also a black trans woman's issue with prevalence rate for African-American black trans women at 48%. Can you believe that? I mean, think about that for a moment. Almost half of all African-American black trans women are HIV infected. And for Hispanic Latino trans women, 17% and Caucasian white trans, trans women um, just under 5%. And again, we do not have any comparable data for trans men. And once again, I want to thank DHSP for pulling this data together. One clinic, one clinic in Los Angeles found similar incident rates for trans women and trans men. And this was presented at the National HIV Summit in, in um, Oakland a couple of months ago. They found uh, 8.7 infections per 100 persons for trans women and 7.1 infections per 100 persons for trans men. But again, we have to keep in mind that this is one clinic where high-risk um, uh, individuals are going to be tested. So this is not a population-based study, although astonishing and worth noting. So the HIV risk behaviors among trans men, there have been very, very few studies on HIV risk behaviors among trans men, so we have to take that into context. Uh, but what we have found consistently is that the trans men that are at risk for HIV are those that report sex with non-trans MSM. And what we find are high levels of risk behaviors, again, among trans men who have sex with non-trans MSM. Uh, low levels of HIV prevalence at this point, but we have to intervene to keep it low. And what we find is cross-sex hormone therapy increases uh, the sexual desire, which increases sexual activity and increases sexual behaviors. Currently, however, it's trans women who represent the most highly impacted risk group in Los Angeles County, as measured by HIV prevalence, HIV incidence, and the rate of new, newly discovered infections. So as a result, the majority of HIV-related research has focused on trans women. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know. HIV testing and care. The rate of undiagnosed HIV infections among trans women is at least twice that of the national um, average, so that not only means high prevalence rates currently, but it means high undiagnosed HIV rates. Trans women are less likely to receive HIV testing and are less likely to perceive HIV as a serious health threat. 
HIV positive trans women are less likely than any other adult population to be linked and retained into HIV care, and among those in care, medication adherence is suboptimal. HIV positive trans women report less confidence in their abilities to maintain treatment adherence and ex experience fewer positive interactions with their providers. In Los Angeles County, trans women are estimated to have the lowest proportion of viral suppression than any other group. And let's look at why. When we look at the HIV testing and care, these, this is all daunting, but it doesn't come in a vacuum. So let's look at what's going on. What are the risk factors that, that are leading to, to this? Let's start with substance use. Trans women report substance use as a means of coping with stigma, discrimination, and hardships associated with their gender presentation. They report elevated rates of alcohol use, uh, marijuana use, and other illegal drug use. In Los Angeles County, um, one study of mine showed 58% self-reported alcohol use, 26 marijuana use. That's not medically prescribed. 22% methamphetamine use, and 66%, 66% reported a lifetime of injecting street drugs or non-medically prescribed hormones. The United States have found rates of substance abuse and dependence vary between 11 and 16%. And we look at, when we look at rates of abuse and dependence, this is beyond use. These are individuals who at that point have increased their level of use to uh, be measured as abuse or dependence by the DSM. Looking at sexual risk behaviors, although some trans women report sex work for pleasure, or as a means of gender affirmation, most engage in sex work for basic economic survival. 44% of trans women in a meta-analysis reported unprotected anal intercourse, 42 reported engaging in sex work, 39 reported unprotected anal intercourse with sex work clients, and 39% reported having sex while high. Sex work among trans women have been associated with hormone misuse. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later on. As many uh, use their in gender presentation to both infirm their gender identity, but also as a means of procuring higher paying customers. So when I look at one study that we did in LA County, this is a study that I did with my colleague, Dr. Fletcher, looking at substance use and sexual risk behaviors among trans women. We looked at, uh, we collected data from 2005 to 2011 with over, 20, with over 2,000 trans women on the streets in Los Angeles. And we divided them into uh, six month cohorts to come to a data sample size of 2181. And we looked at the trends in, in substance use. The red line here is alcohol use, ranging from about 72% and dipping at its lowest at about 40%. The yellow line here is methamphetamine use, which ranges from about uh, 12 or 13% to about uh, 38 percent during these different cohorts, and uh, marijuana is consistently high as well. That's the purple line. Uh, lower uh, rates of cocaine and crack use, although for some cohorts it ranged to as high as 10 percent. So as you can see from this data, we look at this trend, uh, the seven-year trend, where it shows uh, continuously high rates of substance use throughout the uh, seven years. And we look at sexual risk behaviors. We look at uh, sex with both exchange partners and non-exchange partners. Now the non-exchange partners can be any type of a partner. It can be a casual partner or it can be a main partner. It was collapsed into one um, to compare it with exchange partners. And you see that with receptive uh, anal intercourse, 
that there are increased episodes of receptive anal intercourse with exchange partners and with insertive anal intercourse, you see that there are increased episodes of insertive anal, insertive anal intercourse with also with exchange partners. But here's the important information, is look at the inconsistent condom use. 6% with receptive uh, anal intercourse and 5% with insertive anal intercourse. So I'm really happy to report that the trans women are for the most part using condoms with uh, anal intercourse with their exchange partners. The big concern is that they are not using consistent condoms with their uh, non-exchange partners. So that's where the transmission is happening, and that's where interventions really need to focus. They got the message around exchange partners, but there's a lot of socio-cultural factors that lead to non-condom use with partners that are um, their main partners or casual partners. So uh, this is, a, I think, a very important finding that should lead to uh, intervention development. Looking at hormone misuse, 69% of high-risk trans women in LA County reported ever injecting hormones, and 33% reported injecting a substance other than a hormone to enhance their gender presentation. So this is silicones and oils and other fillers that are extremely dangerous. 51% uh, uh, reported obtaining hormones from non-medically a non-medical source, so they're non-prescribed, so we really don't know what's in them. And, um, and let's not forget pu pumping party parties where uh, improperly sterilized needles are shared to inject dangerous um, fillers, gender-enhancing substances, but not hormones. And housing. Structural inequalities place trans women at increased risk of poverty and unstable housing. Trans women face additional hardships when they are exposed to living in public. Um, this is increased levels of physical, sexual, emotional, and psychological injury. You can imagine um, what it's like to be a trans woman who's living in public. Um, unstable housing among trans women is associated with inconsistent condom use and substance abuse. And 55% of trans women accessing homeless shelters report harassment by shelter staff or other residents. 29% uh, report being refused services due to their gender identity. And 22% report being sexually assaulted by shelter staff or other residents. So we looked at the associations between housing status and risk behaviors. And I, I did this work with my colleagues, Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Kissler, who's in the audience. I'll shine my, <laughs> my laser right at her. <laughs> She's a fantastic colleague, and we've worked together on this uh, piece. Uh, we looked at data from March 2015 to March uh, 2012. And we looked at the associations of, of risk factors by housing status. So we divided trans women by housed, marginally housed, or homeless. And marginally housed was def defined as people in, in a, um, a more permanent shelter, not a temporary shelter, or living with somebody on their couch. So they were marginally, or in a hotel room. And what was very interesting to discover, and this is just summarizing a very long and complex article that if anybody's interested, it's available online. But to summarize, what we found were those that are at the greatest risk were those that were marginally housed. Housed trans, trans uh, women also showed risk, uh, particularly with hormone injections and sex work and HIV transmission, homeless trans women also showed risk with street use, uh, not hormone injections, they didn't have the money to buy them, some sex work, 
and with HIV acquisition and transmission. But the marginally housed trans women had high risk at every variable that we mentioned. And so why is this? Well, we found that the marginally housed trans women uh, engaged in sex work as a primary option um, to escape homelessness. So that the money that they gained through sex work provided their marginal housing, it also provided them access to illegal or non-medically prescribed hormones or these other fillers and provided them with the money to purchase substances. The illegal or non-medically prescribed hormones then enhanced the gender presentation that led to more exchange partners. So while housing and enhanced gender presentation can provide physical and psychological comfort, the marginal housing trans women also were associated with increased HIV risk. So it's important to know uh, when you're looking at interventions to consider housing status because that greatly impacts risk factors. And we must speak about uh, incarceration and address this issue. In some urban areas, there's a common misinterpretation or misperception by law enforcement that all trans women engage in sex work or other forms of the street economy. And thus, trans women who are living in, pub in public, who are homeless, who are street-based, experience additional scrutiny by law enforcement. And this work comes from an um, uh, article uh, that is in press now that both uh, Kim and I worked on and worked on with Dahlia Ferlito, and I appreciate the work that you guys did on, that, on this manuscript. Um, so even trans women who are not participating in any illegal activity are targeted and regularly checked for criminal backgrounds and outstanding warrants. If they're engaged in no criminal activity and they have an outstanding warrant, they're incarcerated. So due to either actual or perceived par participation in the underground street economy, which is primarily done for survival, um, high-risk trans women are frequently experienced repeat uh, short or long-term cycles of incarceration. So this is what we have. We end up with this syndemic relationship between hormone misuse, sex work, substance use, and incarceration. Trans women uh, use hormones and other substances to enhance their gender presentation which is, enables them to procure higher paying customers. They use substances to cope with these hardships and then experience periods of incarceration. And when we look at mental health, we find discrimination, transphobia, and stru structural victimization negatively impacts the mental health of trans women. Trans individuals report increased anxiety, depression, and suicidality, and this is all trans individuals. Trans individuals are at extremely high rates of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts compared to other adult populations. So we, we're in the process of, of writing a, a manuscript on the associations of this of psychological and emotional distress based on trans women's level of assault, physical and sexual assault. And we looking at data from 2005 to 2015, 10 years, women who have entered into a CRCS program funded by DHSP. And we looked at those that reported physical or sexual assault and then looked at their levels of psychological and emotional distress to see if there are associations between physical and emotional assault and levels of psychological and emotional distress. And what we found is the purple line here are the trans women. Doesn't read well on this presentation, I'm sorry. Um, so here we have what they call these are published samples of other adult populations 
So this red line here is female psychiatric inmates. And the green line is male psychiatric inmates. These are cisgender females and cisgender male psychiatric inmates. Trans women who experience either physical or sexual assault sometime in their lifetime report levels of emotional and psychological distress that are higher than inmates in a psychiatric hospital. That's the profound effect that sexual and physical assault has on trans women. And when you look at comparing uh, samples of cisgender men and women who are not in a psychiatric hospital, this purple line, which I again apologize is hard to read, shows that levels of psychological and emotional distress for trans women who do not experience, have not experienced any physical and sexual assault beyond living in public as a trans woman experiencing all of the structural inequalities and health disparities that I just mentioned have levels of psychological and emotional distress that are higher than cisgender men and women um, from non-patient samples. This just goes to show you the, the increased level of, physical, of psychological and emotional distress that trans women experience on a daily basis because of the structural inequalities in our society. And when you look at healthcare utilization, only 30 to 40 percent of trans people utilize any regular health care. Approximately half of all trans persons are without health insurance. And in LA County, 64% of trans women report no health insurance. Trans women routinely report discrimination or blatant verbal abuse while seeking standard health care or HIV care. And diminished trust, as we know, of, of, in one's provider decreases one's ability to seek and adhere to care. So this is intensified with trans women. So there's numerous health disparities that trans women face that affect their risk of HIV acquisition and transmission. They are at a disproportionate, I'd say a highly disproportionate HIV disease burden. They experience limited willingness or ability to access social support and services due to the discrimination that's felt when they access these services. We see elevated rates of discrimination and stigma in public set settings. We see violence, uh, physical, forced sex or rape, or violence in the home. Uh, we see discrimination or uh, bias when seeking social services. There's limited access to health care, health insurance, limited employment, and uh, limited educational opportunities. Trans women are twice as likely to be unemployed than non-trans persons. See reported increased substance use, increased survival sex and sex exchange, increased cycles with the criminal justice involvement, increased poverty and homelessness, and unsafe uh, needle protocols. So what do we need to do? Next steps. Let's talk about what can be done here. There are no evidence-based interventions designed specifically for trans women or trans men. Interventions that are designed for MSM or cisgender women or cisgender men do not equally, are not equally effective when working with trans individuals. I really find this to be criminal, <laughs> that at this stage, in 2015 that we don't have evidence-based behavioral interventions for trans women. And what I find particularly appalling is that the people who know me and the people who've worked in my shop know that in 2010, uh, we were funded by the CDC to adapt an evidence-based intervention for trans women. We spent a year adapting the Safety Counts Intervention for Trans Women, rena renamed it Trans Safety Counts. 
We have the manual. We delivered the intervention very, very successfully for four years. Dr. Kistler was the uh, project director. Uh, the process evaluations so, uh, continually showed you know, outstanding findings that this was an effective intervention. It was defunded by the CDC when they moved in the direction of high impact prevention. It was put on the shelf. They weren't, they didn't ask us to put it into a randomized control trial to uh, evaluate efficacy. Uh, we weren't, we, we kept telling them we have this data, do you want this data? They didn't even want to see the data. The intervention, trans safety counts, is on a file in my computer. That's where it lays. That's where it is. So when I say there is no evidence-based intervention specifically for trans women, it's not for lack of trying, folks. I'm one person. My guess is that people around the country have experienced this as well. I'm sure there's one in San Francisco and probably other pockets of the United States. Um, so this is, this is really discrimination that needs to be addressed that when you put the time and energy into implementing these interventions, when you test them for four years, and then to be told, we're gonna defund it because we're moving in the direction of high impact, and, well, I'm gonna move to my next bullet point here. <laughs> okay, because I'll address that in a second, here. We need effective interventions, here we go. Yes, there is still a need for behavioral interventions. Absolutely, we cannot have an entire nation that's interventions are dependent on seek, test, treat, and retain. A test, identify, test, treat, retain, that's critical. Absolutely critical. We must move in the direction of viral suppression. Absolutely. But at the expense of high risk individuals, who are some of them who are still negative and those that are positive need interventions to provide social support and services for housing, mental health, employment, education. We will see an upsurge, not a decline, unless we get back to some effective behavioral interventions. And also continue with a test you know, treat and retain. It's not one or the other. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have to do both. Both are equally important. And for trans women, we must have effective interventions for post-incarcerated trans women. We have to break that cycle if we're gonna put a dent on this in this uh, epidemic with trans women. We need to develop effective interventions, here we go, that break the cycle of hormone misuse, sex work, substance use, and incarceration for high-risk trans women. And trans women need specific interventions based on their varying needs in different subgroups. Transgender women are not a one, you know, one fit all intervention. Among trans women, there are different needs and different risk behaviors. I mean, come on now, we all remember, those of us who are old enough remember 20 years when there was like one intervention for um, gay and bisexual men because it was before there was even the MSM acronym. And we didn't accept that. That wasn't appropriate. Well, it's the same now with trans women. And we need effective interventions, again, to successfully link and retain HIV trans women into uh, care. Um, and we need interventions to um, test and treat HIV positive and HIV negative trans persons uh, with into hepatitis and STI testing and treatment. Trans women, or all trans individuals, uh, need low and no cost medically monitored hormones. Now, I, I have a 
um, program for HIV positive trans women of color to have them linked and retained in care. Dr. Kistler is the project director of that. She's doing a great job. And since we started this study about three years ago, I have been saying consistently that if no cost hormone therapy was linked to HIV medical care, there would be no HIV positive trans women out of care. It's that simple. Attach hormones to HIV care, they're there. They're at the doctor's appointment. We need efficacy trials on PEP and PrEP for trans women and trans men. There was a, a subpopulation of, tr of 30 trans women in a larger study of PrEP for MSM. That's insufficient. We're hoping that this will happen in our community in 2016. There was an initiative by CHRP. Um, a few uh, sites in Los Angeles went after this initiative. We hope one is funded and we can bring PrEP for trans women and uh, trans men into Los Angeles. We'll see. We need longitudinal studies on disease prevalence and incidence for trans populations. We need to look at these long-term uh, trends. Only through longitudinal studies can we address the associations between epidemiological data and health disparities. And we need to increase visibility of trans indiv individuals in professional and medical settings and in social service agencies. Healthcare services must be informed and sensitive to the medical and psychological and sociocultural issues related to gender transi transition and gender nonconforming individuals. And uh, uh, three years ago, when we started this study for HIV positive trans women of color, um, Kim and I went on a tour of a clinic in LA County that a lot of trans women were going to. We were there with our funders from HRSA. We were given a, 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 a wonderful tour of the facility. And it was commented that there were absolutely no images of trans women in this HIV care facility. None. Not one. Not one. And so uh, we wrote a, a supplement, and through that supplement, we received some funding, and we created this poster. I'm, I uh, assume many of you have seen it because we brought the poster here to the commissioner uh, and gave it away, and uh, it says, positively trans, positively healthy. Trans persons must feel, and there's your Sabelle, there she is. Trans persons must feel included rather than excluded in clinics and social service agencies. I mean, can you imagine walking into a healthcare provider and not seeing any references that look like you anywhere? And then you're asked to come back. Gender invisibility and affirmation increase, gender visibility and affirmation increases linkage and retention to care. Come on, that's a no-brainer. So, here we are today. The so sociocultural experience of being a trans person today is similar to that of being an overt gay or lesbian person in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. I think there's a few of us in this room who remember what it was like to be an out gay person in the 60s and 70s. Who's as old as I am? Okay. It was hard. It was hard with family. It was hard with institutions. The, the, the homophobia was blatant. It was hard. And look where we are today. Un unbelievable uh, where we've come. But it doesn't take, it's not gonna take 50 years with trans people. We, we, set, we set the ground that work there. Uh, society and cultural is, culture is changing very, very swiftly. As a society, I am certain that we will evolve in our treatment, acceptance, and understanding of trans uh, persons. When we were living in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with this intense homophobia, I never, ever thought that we would experience marriage equality. Never thought in my lifetime that I would live 
to see that day. And I mean, that's unbelievable. So when we think of where we have shifted in these years, and I think of where we are with trans individuals, I think the movement is going to be swifter. It's only going to come if we all do the work. It's only going to come if we force the funders to give, you know, fund these interventions and we force society and uh, culture to make these shifts. But I believe that we can do it. I believe we will do it. And I don't think it's going to take another 50 years to see it happen. I really believe that we have a marriage equality today and we're moving in the direction of gender equality tomorrow. Thank you.